Hello and welcome to video lecture 1.2 for the Living Epic Courses. This is the lecture that's going to introduce you to what we might call the nuts and bolts of the Barnic occasion. First of all, what we can reconstruct about how it might have looked to an audience around 800 BCE. Uh, and then after that, the real kind of dry nuts and bolts stuff, the stuff you need to know to really understand how it works about the meter and about, most importantly, this thing called the formula, which gives the theory that goes over all the thing called oral formulaic theory its name, formulaic, obviously, from formula. Okay, so first something that's a little more interesting, that is what we can say about a bardic occasion that might have occurred and probably was occurring all over the Greek world. Now, uh, at, in around the date uh, 800 BCE. Now, the tradition almost certainly stretches back one or two or three hundred years before then, um, during which time the myths that we know of as the most important of the Greek myths, the myths about Troy and the other wars that were eventually linked up within the tradition to Troy, especially a war at Thebes that's kind of shadowy because we don't have an equivalent tradition to the tradition of Homer about it. Um, but all of this is to say that from around 1200 BC on there are these stories and that at some point between 1200 and 800 BCE those stories begin to get formalized into a system of themes that a bard can sing on a given occasion when he's being uh, paid, prospectively, by, say, the lord of a manor. Now, a lot of this is conjecture. A lot of this has um, just enough archaeological evidence to make us think we couldn't be too far wrong about it. Some of it is comparative by looking at the way traditions like the Yugoslavian Bardic tradition worked. Um, but uh, it's always fun to try to recreate this uh, at the level of granularity where we start to feel our antiquarian passion come alive and we start to feel like we really know what it was like to be alive in 800 BCE. So it's definitely worth doing. So I invite you to imagine a guy with a lyre, L-Y-R-E, which is pretty much the equivalent of a guitar, um, sitting in front of an audience, maybe a little bit off to the side, because the main attraction would be the lord of the manor who is giving the feast. And throughout the feast, and this we know from the Odyssey, as you'll read in Odyssey Book 8, Throughout the feast, the bard is singing, um, and we can imagine varying degrees of attention on the part of the audience. Maybe you have some of the people of the region who are very interested and are sitting close to the bard um, and have asked to have seats close to the bard so they can pay attention, and then maybe you have a mass of people. Um, think about uh, moviegoers who are more intent on their popcorn than on the film. Um, a mass of the people kind of further away who are concentrating on the conversation. Um, at some point maybe in the tradition, or with perhaps a good enough bar, you start to have something like a rapt audience, R-A-P-T. Um, and that's the kind of audience that Odysseus talks about at the beginning of Book 9, when he says it's the best of all possible occasions, the one that has the most charis, K-H-A-R-I-S, um, the Greek word that means grace or favor. Uh, and in any case, this is the occasion we're to imagine, and we have it, as I said, vividly depicted in the Odyssey, thank goodness. So imagine that happening about 800 BCE, the bard with his lyre singing songs that are, as we heard in the last lecture, recompositions on existing themes, new stories that are based on old stories but which are nevertheless composed in real time by the bard as he moves along with the story, trying always to um, give himself a reputation for virtuosity, also to please himself, and remember that Telemachus said that about Phineas by his own story, um, and undoubtedly the person in the room who would have had the highest standards for the bard would be the bard himself. Okay, so that's the picture. Well, how did it actually work? It worked based on formulas. Now, you may remember from Lecture 1, the first line of the Iliad, main in aida tea peleia do achilleos. Now, the end of that line is our very first formula, peleia do achilleos, which just means Peleus' son Achilles. 
you probably heard the dump but a dump but a dump bump there at the end. That formula fits into the end of a line of dactylic hexameter. Dactylic hexameter is just a meter that uses six, that's hex, six feet of dactyls, which is long, short, short, or spondees, which is long, long. So, main and a uh, is a dactyl, a de te, another dactyl, a pe, spondy, le i a, uh, dactyl, do achilleos, dactyl spondy. And every line ends with dactyl spondy. That's the kind of dependable dump on a dump pump that's at the end of the line that tells you that the line is now at an end. So, the way it works is you start, if you're a bard, by learning the formulas and then you work up from there and the formulas are always there to be depended upon. And the most important formulas of all are the ones that have the name of a hero in them. Eleia do Achilleos, Volumetis Odysseus, which means much cunning Odysseus, Peripron Penelopeia, which means circumspect Penelope. And you can tell that these become building blocks, and it's out of these building blocks through a process that would have taken years and years to master that a bard learned how to put a recomposition of these stories together. Now, as you'll notice as you're reading the Iliad and the Odyssey, these little formulas get built up into much bigger things, which tend to be called themes, which seem to be, and very often are, repeated literally from occasion to occasion. And here we have things like the narration to Agamemnon from the dream, turns out to be a false dream, in book two of the Iliad, which then gets repeated twice more. So that kind of repetition can happen. Probably in the living tradition, before it gets written down, it wouldn't have been exact because that kind of memorization becomes possible only with writing. But that doesn't really matter much. What matters is that even if you're repeating things literally and long strings of lines literally, around those little literal repetitions evolve much more complicated ways and much more complicated innovations of telling the story. Okay, so there are the nuts and bolts in a nutshell, and this is the point to make again another little gesture towards video games, because I think you can probably see that when you're playing a level of Halo, or you're doing a quest in, say, RuneScape, or you're playing even a minigame in Club Penguin, you're taking elements that are given, that you know how to do, and recombining them in new ways. Does it evolve into great art the way Homer does, is the question I'm always asked and the one I'm always asking myself. Well, did every formula evolve into great art for the Homeric bards? I think the answer to that has to be no. But then the more interesting question is, what does it take for a player of Club Penguin to create an uh, artistically interesting performance in Club Penguin. And that's the kind of thing we're going to be dealing with under a whole bunch of different headings as we head on down the road. Now you know, know the nuts and bolts, and I'll see you next time in Lecture 1.3, where we're start go going to be starting to deal with the video game part of it in more detail. Thanks.